Welcome to GUI and in web browsers weekly call. It's 18th of December 2019. And this week I'm joined by Dietrich and Hugo. Uh, there's an agenda. Feel free to add items to it. Uh, I believe the first item is mine, so I'll just I'll just share my screen. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the stable release of IPFS Companion 2.10. It's a roundish number. Um, so this is a stable release. Um, it brings uh, three improvements in three areas. Um, first one is the experience uh, of visiting a website which is backed by DNS link. Uh, the second one is improved control over IPFS integrations, like enabling, disabling it per specific website. And the third space is the experience of importing files to IPFS. Um, so importing files to IPFS in the past looked uh, pretty uh, crude. It was like a crude experience. Uh, users uh, added file to IPFS using IPFS companion and it opened the same file at the gateway. It was either public or local gateway, but it was it. Uh, user did not, like had no UI for managing, for remembering all the uploaded files. It was just uh, an implicit low level pin, which was difficult to reason about. People had like thousands of them and which one represent what file. We had no, it was pretty bad experience uh, uh, the longer you use it. So we switched uh, our GUI application, including like IPFS Companion, to MFS. And now, when you import file using uh, IPFS Companion's uh, interface on the menu, using this one, share files via IPFS, or using the context menu. Uh, like you click, right click on an image, select image and import IPFS. The file will be opened in web UI's files screen. So in it, and it will also be uh, put in a directory uh, with a timestamp. You can customize the path. So it's now much easier to reason what, ty what files I've added, when I've added them, if you want to simply stop hosting some files. You just remove them from your uh, MFS using web UI user interface. Uh, no lo you no longer need to worry about low level pins. We no longer even put low level pins. Just the presence of the file in your MFS keeps it around, protects it from being garbage collected. So that's pretty big improvement uh, for user experience. Um, and also you can like customize the path during uh, like ad hoc uh, imports for a single file. Um, that's, I think that's it for uh, import improvements. Then uh, the control of IPFS integrations per website uh, is improved. Now there's a single toggle under active tab. For example, here you can see it's a DNS link website loaded from local gateway. Uh, integrations are enabled, so that means uh, the website was loaded from local gateway and stuff like window IPFS, all the content scripts run, got injected on the page and are running. However, if you like disable this, uh, the redirect will be reverted. The website no longer will be redirected to local gateway. You will get option to open it on a, your gateway of your preference. In this case, it's a local host one, but that will happen in a new tab it will uh, not uh, like share the origin. It will open a new tab that will be a separate uh, an instance of that uh, website. So if you prefer that, uh, you can also uh, change this behavior and like disable redirect of uh, DNS link website permanently, or just like per website using this uh, toggle. Um, I believe that's it, more or less. Uh, we also, uh, if you choose to disable redirect of DNS link websites, you have option to still in the background 
preload the data to your local node. So even though you would uh, use the original HTTP server of like of the website author's uh, choice, uh, if the server goes down, IPFS companion would try to recover and open it from local gateway and the local gateway would not have to waste time for finding the content on the network because that would be already on your uh, local node. Uh, and there's new web UI, which has some improvements around sharing uh, files. Uh, now, when you share a single file, the link uh, contains a file name uh, and some uh, interesting developments, including uh, restored ESR compatibility for Firefox users. So if you are using uh, Firefox ESR, uh, this latest version we is now compatible again, and you can get all those new features. Um, I believe that's it for companion updates. Uh, oh, last, <laughs> uh, last thing to mention is you can install it today from Firefox store, at Firefox uh, uh, add-on store, or you can wait about one week until it's accepted to Chrome Web Store if you are like Chromium uh, browser uh, user. Uh, details are here. I'll probably mention it multiple times so people are already tired of me <laughs> mentioning it. But it, if you install from Chrome Web Store, you will get the older version. Eventually, it will automatically get updated. But for now, if you want latest and the greatest, maybe consider switching to Firefox. Who knows? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, any questions on, on this release? Yeah, I had, a, I had a question about the, uh, so the MFS changes are, are amazing. Like that is so, so great that files uploaded are MFS by default. I had a question about metadata. Um, you know, there's been talk about adding metadata support at different places. Uh, the directory structure of the resulting of MFS ads here end up with these directory a file, directory file, directory file, directory file, which is kind of a pain and not really how the experience that people have in Finder or Windows Explorer today in the regular file system. So what is the path forward for utilizing core support for metadata? When will that land? What part of that feature will be? And how will that, is there is the goal here to migrate to that type of metadata system as opposed to this directory structure? It's a, it's a good question. Um, it's a first tab, and the simplest way was to, to make it like timestamp based. So at least you know when you uploaded it. And you can reason that, oh, it's like a year old or like half a year old. I probably don't need this, this data around. Uh, when it comes to metadata, we, like, we are technically able to store things like uh, if it's imported from a specific website, like the original URL and stuff like that. We don't have a good place for storing that metadata. I mean, we could come up with some very thin JSON based file format and just like drop additional file into a directory. Um, UnixFS, as far as I know, simply just allows like so simple attributes. Maybe UnixFS v2 would allow more advanced metadata to be embedded within the DAG, but right now the only uh, way to add date, like meta, additional metadata is just like to add additional uh, file to the directory. It's an open, I'd say it's an open, uh, open problem. Uh, is it like uh, refining this user experience of how to, how a file import should look like. I believe uh, IPFS Companion is the first GUI application in IPFS ecosystem which actually does this. Um, so, because like we, we had to figure it out where to put files and like putting everything on the root was probably not the best idea. So this is like the second worst, worst idea. Um, I don't have a good answer to this, just uh, that it's a first iteration. Even the like timestamp-based time path is just like a proposal. We can change it in the next version. We can migrate users, uh, like the new users, to a new path. It, it's, it's not like it's breaking anything if we change the default uh, destination. Uh, 
um, it just uh, it just needs much more uh, uh, thought, especially if we uh, make this uh, change of adding files automatically imports them to MFS. Uh, there was the, uh, there is a proposal by Alan, I believe, to like change like IPFS add command, the command line one, to IPFS import and make it instead of like do adding low level pin by default importing it to a directory in, in MFS like slash imports. And it's also like the op same open question there. How should that directory structure be look like? What type of metadata do we want to store? Do we want to store like the path from which we imported the file? Um, so it's, uh, I, I feel those are valid questions, but we should not like evaluate them, excuse me, evaluate them uh, only like from IPFS compliant perspective. I'd say it's more important to think about them from that perspective of this command line core API v1, which will replace the current one. Uh, not sure if it's useful. That's how I see it. A, 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 long, a long and complicated road ahead. But it's already I, be better than just- It's already like, better, so much have, better. Having like hashes and things. Yeah, I think from a, from, a, from a design perspective too, I think we kind of, having a goal, like is it an explicit goal to have a file, a, as close to a file system like experience or not, will help us kind of figure out what the requirements are. Um, and I guess, you know, like the TLDR, like my ask of this work is that we think about what that, we decide what that di design goal is so that we can feed the requirements back into the core. So if, if, the, if we think that we want that type of experience to be possible, then we should be telling the core teams what we need from Unifx, Unix FS V2 or what we need from JSIPFS and GoIPFS to be able to implement, be able to do these things. Yeah, I, I believe it's a, it's a valid way. The, the only thing is that like to not be super focused around companion. It's, it's more, like, sh sh we should focus on the, the command line one and then uh, adjust comp implementation in companion. Um, so that's, that's a good question. I'm, I guess I'm not sure I agree there that like, I feel like our, the, the power that we have with companion is a exploration space for what the end user application patterns are going to be. And the command line experience is not going to help us flesh out what those needs are. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I probably, uh, I skipped a few sentences <laughs> which I had in my mind. What I mean is the, uh, the, pro uh, the key problem that this release of IPFS companion solves is the situation when someone uh, learns about IPFS and they like, oh, they add a file from the command line, IPFS add file, and they don't see it in web UI, right? Uh, so I see, yeah, so it the, definitely addresses the, that the, problem. Yeah, so the user experience uh, I have in mind is this entire, like this path. When someone adds from the command line, it should be visible in the web UI and it should not feel too different to what Companion is doing right now. Uh, so it should be, be like, like remove complexity. It, it's just added to IPFS. People should not think that it's like MFS. Uh, it was just imported and I can like manage it. All right, uh, more on that in the future. Um, next topic, uh, maintenance of uh, IPFS public gateway checker. Um, I can like quickly share a screen. It's something I wanted to mention that there's this community list of uh, public gateways and uh, it simply checks which uh, gateway is up, which gateway supports uh, course header and stuff like that. I, I see probably my PR got merged because it looks different. Um, yep, so there are like, uh, there have been a list of PRs which were not reviewed, but we will do our best to uh, get to those uh, in more timely manner. 
not sure if uh, there's more to add uh, to that. It's on my list to to check into this repo, just like we probably should for awesome IPFS IO and other websites. We just need to figure a framework how to ensure there's always like someone checking on those repos. Uh, it's just like yet another repo that we we have. It's like under IPFS uh, org for historical reasons, but it's actually like IPFS shipyard. It's like community driven, provided by community. We don't maintain those gateways. Those are just like volunteers uh, providing their uh, server uh, servers and bandwidth. Um, and we should like we we should make a better job uh, of figure it out how to be a better steward to those uh, public resources. Um, is there? Do we need to maybe have like a a weekly, just like a week, a weekly triage, where we have a list of repos? Because it's definitely like this meeting. Like we we talked about, I saw IPFS being in this meeting also, and that was kind of just like us stepping in to fill the gap. But there might be from a community perspective, like a a broader IPFS community issue triage to make sure that these repos are are not falling behind. I've, I, ex yeah, my thoughts exactly. What I've been thinking, it's sort of like a, like a can, we we had a, the, those types of uh, waffle boards or like Zen boards or maybe like GitHub projects would probably be enough uh, when there's like an inbox of new issues which needs to be triaged. And we probably could uh, set something like that. We had uh, one for, well, like we have one for async uh, iterables refactor, I believe, across all the repos. We could have one like this dedicated board for those IPFS shipyard and community uh, uh, repos, which uh, we really want to uh, tend to, but not always have time, or there are like other fires if we had like separate, could be part of community call. Uh, or maybe a separate call. Uh, I don't want to, but it, it, it's something to think about. Yeah. The IPFS community manager job description should go live in the next couple of days, and I think that would be uh, like the definitely the role that would maybe help drive some of this. But there's this projects like this are kind of in between. Like the, it's not. Awesome IPFS is definitely more on the community end of things. Public gateway checker is like, okay, are people, people operating gateways are definitely part of our community, but it's a very different roles, right? Um, and they're maybe not contributing to people that are contributing to the core. So it's kind of both in support of broader adoption stuff around public gateways, but also community. I, I, I do kind of tend to think that if we, if there's, the list of these repos is probably pretty short, like five of the ones that we really want to make sure don't fall too far behind. And a, a weekly community call might, might be the right place to do that. Yep. 20, um, Q1 2020. Yes. Uh, yep. I think that that one is as well me. So uh, I finally got to the uh, PR with end-to-end -end test suit for web UI. And I believe it, it's green now. Yep. So it's still not uh, still not finished. I want to add a better test for peers and for like uploading directory on the file screen. Uh, however, I believe it right now. If we see the build, the way it works, it runs the end-to-end -end tests against both uh, Go and JS. Uh, and those tests are super fast, like 10 seconds. Because uh, there's not much just like, uh, I use the latest uh, IPFSD control, which is super cool. Uh, and uh, and uh, just a puppeteer and that, that's it. Uh, and the way we maybe not here, but I just wanted to show how how it's, how easy it is if I'm not, <laughs> I misclicked, apologies. Um, it's as easy as this, but you, you just run end-to-end te -end test with this command. By default, it will run against Go IPFS. However, you can customize and run 
uh, it against JS. And if you want to customize either Go on JS version that you are running against, you do that with uh, you do that with uh, within package JSON. The Go version is here. It's uh, the Go IPFS dev is a Go binary that we publish to npm, uh, and JSIPFS is here. So, in case of uh, JSIPFS, when we will want to like be a part of this early uh, adopter program in JSIPFS, uh, they would use um, they would like check out uh, web UI repo and simply bump uh, this version here to their own. Uh, like from the like the latest master or something like that, and then run tests against JS, and that will run end-to-end -end tests against like the latest JS IPFS, which is uh, which will tell us if it's breaking our end-to-end -end tests. Uh, is it breaking anything in Web UI? I feel that's more or less it. <laughs> I yeah, I'll I'll just finish it probably this week or after uh, Christmas and. Uh, it will be uh, ready when we reach the new year. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm curious about the the uh, and Hugo too if if you have any opinions and thoughts on whether package.json is the right way to be able to swap different versions. So, how, what does the workflow look like for a Go engineer who wants to run this test? against changes they've made to go IPFS or one of those repos. So does, does that make it easy for them? Does that work with how their CI works? Oh, uh, I forgot, uh, uh, Hugo, uh, um, yeah, I think it was already, like there's a, a third type of, uh, of uh, IPFS D control, like the remote one, when you can specify a specific host name and port. So I'll add it, uh, it's not on the to-do, but I'll add it. Uh, it will you have you, you have uh, uh, the third type is in process. Oh yeah, um, yeah. but I want no. to uh, add uh, the third type uh, to this setup when you pass a uh, uh, URL of the HTTP API that you want to test against, and that will enable people to test uh, run end-to-end -end test against like any uh, node they want. Like if they build custom Go IPFS on their local machine, they don't have it published anywhere. They just run it. Uh, mm. So that will be like the third option and it will be documented in the readme. Oh yeah, you can set, a, set that up with the endpoint option. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Do you, do you set up, um, how do you set up the CTL? Do you predefine the... Um, Oh yeah, it's uh, I create a factory, and uh, the type of factory is defined. Uh, it depends on the environment variable if it's present. Um, yep. Yeah, but you need to define. The, um, just show me. Oh, okay. Jump to go oh, to. Oh jump yeah, two. yeah, it's here. It's basically this. Okay, that the, is not right. The type. The type is right, but um, that will not guarantee you that the test will run with the versions you have in packages. They will use it, uh, use the version from the path? It will use, are you setting up the path? No. Okay, so uh, that, uh, that setup will use the versions in IPFS DCTL package JSON. Oh, because it uh, ships with the, its own? Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. what you need to do is you, you, you can pass a second option to the, the factory, yep. which basically overrides by type. And you can set up everything for each type. And then uh, when you spawn, yep. you just um, you just uh, you get the options predefined okay. yeah. previously. I, I think I've uh, I, I've seen how uh, they customize the the JSIPFS binary 
in JSAPFS tests uh, to run against yeah, the, the yeah, local. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll, I'll do that before uh, I finish the draft of this PR. Uh, yep, and you should also you should also set up the HTTP client and um, JSIPFS. You, have, you basically have uh, three options: one for the binary, one for the HTTP client, and one for JSIPFS core. And you should set up um, all of them for each type that you want to run. And then the, th the stuff you, you are using the environmental uh, variable, variable, it should go into spawn and not into um, create factory. Yep, will do, thanks. So you can, you can extract the factory um, out of the function there and just call spawn. So you predefine everything at the beginning of your code flow or whatever. And then where you are creating factory, you should only be calling spawn with everything else predefined. Yep. We'll do. I'll probably mention you when I'm like ready with the PR, just to double check. Thanks. Um, next one is Oprah Build. Uh, real quick before we leave testing, uh, let's see. I, for, I think this was on the Q4 OKRs, the specific item. I can't learn it right now. Um, so can you add a, add a note and do the final scoring there if you haven't already? So I think uh, oh, this yeah. is the kind of the patch of getting the test up, but I, th I think we also want to get that into CI as well, like have this running automatically. And I feel like we haven't figured out where, when we want these tests exactly to run. Like it should be in the Go IPFS CI, it should be the JS IPFS CI, it should be in the CI for when we make changes to this code as well. Uh, it's like the PR already has update uh, for the CI of the web UI repo. And when it's merged, I will, I will PR at least JS IPFS one. Um, with Go, yeah, I, I'll, I'll figure it out. Probably when I made changes, Hugo described, uh, I also... Yeah, made. one more thing. This is, uh, this yeah. is running in Chrome, right? With Puppeteer. Yeah. So if you are only setting up uh, the type Go and type JS, this is uh, doing a remote daemon, uh, a remote, um, a remote daemon uh, controller. So you should add a third type so you can test the um, JS IPFS instance running in the browser. Mm. Oh yeah, in, in the same context like in uh, IPFS companion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think like for like developers, uh, just like did you mentioned the the remote one. It's probably the the most useful when you're just yeah they they either change the 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 package JSON or they provide um, the the API endpoint with a, a an environmental um, variable right yep G three are we moving on to Opera. Yeah, we tested everything. Okay, as long as everything's tested. Uh, so we had, I think the last issue that we had to report back to Opera for the latest build was about the origin isolation. I, I haven't had time to go back and look at that in more detail, but I know that you were checking that out. I I don't think I got got back uh, to the P like I I've seen your feedback on the PR but it's not merged yet. Wait, which um, PR? Uh, with uh, with a test for or origin isolation. Uh, I, okay. I yeah, I simply wanted to see what's under window location uh, object. So that's a good smoke test 
is their actual origin isolation because you can that's right. like the URL object so you can check origin attribute is it like the root of the gateway or is it like the same thing and the, as the content root in IPFS uh, so it's a good place to check because if that place is set correctly nearly it's like, like probably everything else works because uh, that like it's like the key indicator for origin isolation all right, so I guess my question then is, is, is there, do we need, are there changes that we need to make, we need to ask them to make? I'd say yes. Uh, yeah. how, however, the, it, I think we want that fixed. We or want at least the functionality removed, yeah, right? Like, yeah, we just need to be very specific what we, what's the minimum fix here. The minimum fix yeah. here is to have unique origin per IPFS content root. So IPFS content root is basically like the CID, right? So yeah. if they use under, like, uh, under the UI, if they just use HTTP gateway, it needs to be subdomain gateway. If they implement native protocol, the native protocol itself should use uh, the CID as the authority component of the URL. Uh, both solve the security problem, uh, and the subdomain gateway is probably most more realistic. Uh, if they are using like Infura, uh, then like they need to like provide feedback to Infura or something like that. Okay, C can you write write up those couple of sentences? Yes. Wait, the the sentences you just said aloud. <laughs> I will, uh, I will add them while uh, you move to the next point of the agenda. Sounds good. The next item on the agenda, when I find the agenda in my tabs, is browser design guidelines. So Jim Kosum has been working on that. We passed the research phase. We're now into the final set of recommendations and formulating what this looks like. Uh, the results could be a deck and that we'll probably like, I'll do a, a, a IPFS weekly, we'll like beta test the deck uh, by giving a presentation of the final results. Um, it, was, it was really interesting, the kind of the interviews of, we interviewed designers at um, a couple of different browser vendors, at the lead designer for Firefox, uh, a UX designer for the different Firefox mobiles, uh, we talked to the lead, one of the lead designers at Brave, um, and then he also interviewed but a number of non-technical users, kind of about ideas and attitudes around the location bar, or the address bar, as we are now calling it, uh, because there are not just locations there anymore. Um, and it, it was really interesting conclusion or findings around that the human readable names like we're like we kind of in the abstract say hey whatever's in there should be a human readable thing but it's a little deeper than that like people actually do make kind of like relative value judgments on on how much they understand what something is based on the path structures of of addresses uh you know things like even if you're not technical you understand what like blog slash 2020 slash 01 slash 13 slash my new blog post like you can look at that and at a glance understand, get some understanding of value from what's happening there, even if you don't know what it means. Um, so there's like when people look at the URL bar, they might not understand what it means in terms of a network operation happening, request, response, uh, whether it comes from one server or many, uh, whether it's a, what a 404 means, a why. Like, so there's a lot, lack of understanding from the technical aspect, but there's also a lot of cognitive uh, processing that happens of the location bar. Uh, people know padlock is good, green is good, but they don't understand the underpinnings of why. Um, and this makes the design question around what padlock alternatives would be really important. And that's kind of where we're at in the in the process now is synthesizing the results of the research in order and then using that in the context of what IPFS means when it's IPFS colon slash slash in the browser. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, well, like, what is the distinction between transport level encryption, but an absence of a DNS-based trust model? Well, 
uh, combined with the cryptographic verification that means that nothing was made in the middle. So, or uh, also how do you visually communicate the fact that if something loaded at this address with IPFS, it is the only thing that ever will load at this address or nothing might load at this address. It's either this or nothing. Yeah, like, like the people don't have a concept or even like language around immutability. Right. It's like a super important property, which we just don't have even visual language or even yep. like language. No, like, so we're talking about things like, part of this might even be like put, going to the thesaurus and giving a little word cloud for each one of these things. So we're like, you know, currently here's what the lock means. Um, how would you show this differently? Like would the lock have a, a little badge on it with the number of peers connected uh, at the time? Do you have a constant view of how many peers are connected? Do you only show where the peers are connected when somebody's looking at IPFS resource? Um, do, you, do you make changes to the lock color to identify that transport level encryption happened, but there's no business registered with the SSL certificate? So right now, like there's a lot of like the, the way that browsers approach communicating this is really relies on DNS as the trust model for that encryption. So you have transport level encryption, but ultimately the like, trust model ties back to the fact that the SSL certificate ties to a DNS registration and the DNS registration is tied to a physical address that you can mail something to or that you could drive your car to and walk up and knock on the door. And ultimately that's fake, that's false, right? But that's the only fucking thing that browsers have. And it's so actually, what is it? It actually does not need to be an address. Like if you are using like Acme, you just- I, Exactly, I know. Like, so we have this collective, like from a, from a, from a browser security engineering though, and an internet security engineering standpoint, they, they do lean on that. Like that is, that is all we got. And they understand that that's, that like, we're working with what, what we got. Like, uh, and that, that, that's, we don't have another alternative. And the alternative that IPFS presents is, is challenging because while we guarantee transport level encryption, so we have transport level security from that perspective by default in IPFS, right? We don't have content level encryption and that's fine. We, we, there's no expectation of guaranteeing that. We don't have the whole user identity and key system, no problem. But the trust, there's a, non, a non-zero value to the trust model that's implied by having a, SSL regist- a DNS, SSL encryption that's tied directly to the DNS registration of a specific business, right? And the, we don't have anything to offer there. We say there's no man in the middle risk, great. But what trust authority does the, does the address itself come with? And we're like, we're none, right? Like there's zero. And our path-based addressing model kind of underscores the risks of that, which is everything falls into this kind of global scope of data and you wave your hands and say, if, if it came unencumbered with risk of man in the middling that you should be able to trust it. We're like, yeah, I don't think anybody really actually thinks that. We don't think that really but we haven't presented another model for evaluating the relative trust of an address that was given to you out of band. If that address came to you through a chat app and you clicked that link and it opened up in your IPFS based mobile browser, how do you evaluate the relative trust of that? Well, it's from where you got it, right? So ultimately what our trust model comes down to is the fact that we say users have to take the responsibility and ownership right now of trusting addresses that received out of band. Where did it come from? That's really all we have to lean on. And what browsers actually do one better, you know, they're like, then we have this whole separate system for, for placing that trust, even though it might be misguided and not ultimately that much value because you can hydrate them either for the low, low cost of, of $1 a year, right? So that, there's a little bit of, there's like this gap that's like, this really useful exercise in just kind of thinking through where those gaps are. Um, we can't pretend like we don't have them. So, and it, in order to be able to close those gaps or at least minimize them, it's really important for us to acknowledge that they exist. And this exercise is a really good, I think there's gonna be a really good outcome in, in 
and being able to have a language and with clear understanding and articulation of what those gaps are when you actually have to walk through the process of how it, how would I design a browser for, for a billion people to use that supports IPFS and then you have, you're confronted with these types of questions. So it, it, I think the end result is gonna be really good and I'm, I'm excited to be able to share the results hopefully in January we'll have it all polished up and done. So maybe that one of the IPFS weeklies in January will be a walkthrough of, of this work. Um, but again, there's this like, it's very interesting because this is a really a jump forward in thinking about what native IPFS looks like. And as we found in the CID and subdomain stuff that's been going on in the IPFS hosting web apps and how the, the people in our own community are very, they lean heavily on success looking like a local host URL that companion redirects to a local gateway that, redirect, that is desktop and that looking like success. And if we wanna, if we wanna leapfrog that to like uh, being able to set ourselves up for a mass adoption, we need to be able to visualize what native IPFS actually looks like and actually what the, what the relative risks are and designing for it is a good exercise in doing that. So I feel like we're, we're gonna have, a, there's a lot of side benefits of doing this work and helping us reorient how our own community thinks about what IPFS success looks like. And it's, it's complicated. It really points out some of the, you know, glaring bits in the, in the overall application model um, from a privacy and security and surveillance. Like we don't, we don't have good answers for surveillance. Like, especially if, if I, every IPFS address has its own origin, like you can still set cookies and stuff and you can still make network requests to, to ways people that can track you. Like there's nothing really preventing that kind of thing from happening. Like what does a service worker loaded into an IPFS origin mean? Honestly, you don't even like, even if you like, don't, don't think about browser context, like the distributed mechanics make it e like there's actually, it's easier to track who's interested in specific content. Yeah. Um, so we need to be able to have, and it, we need to be able to have a plan and a, and a story around how we communicate those relative risks. If, if we want to, you know, have, have browsers at the billion user or even 100 million user level considered adoption of IPFS. So this is some front work way in advance of solving those problems later and hopefully setting us up for a more, a clearer and more honest understanding of where the gaps are in the technical solution as IPFS so that we can fix those earlier rather than later. Um, so just fun, fun stuff. Super, su super cool uh, to see a movement in, the, in this problem space. Usually it's been either like very hand wavy or just like uh, not addressed at all. And those are super hard questions, uh, given like the history of the, the, the mental model around secu web security and uh, <laughs> and how different our security guarantees are right now. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's an exercise to be done in trade-offs too. Like, like all all of security and privacy is, is a question of trade-offs anyway. And I want us to be able to really clear about when we're making when users are presented with the options of of trade-offs there. So a user might say, I under I am aware that this content is not sensitive. And therefore, I, I am taking down my tracking shields. I don't care how many people I get it from. I just want the image to load. And I am choosing local network reliability and stability over broader tracking guarantees. But like, that's, a, that's an option we should let people make. And I, looking at IPFS choices through the lens of those types of trade-offs, it will help us understand the user better and what their needs are and what the context under which their decision making is going to is going to happen. But there's still a lot of a lot of work to do there. I feel like this is just the beginning. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting how some lessons could be learned from uh, from the old web, like from like existing HTTP. Uh, system when we there's this problem of like men in the middle or like centralized servers and uh like projects like tor and tor browser 
uh, like providing a different set of guarantees uh, to like users who need uh, them. And they, there's even like a slider, which is like gives a convenience versus like speed. Um, we probably will need a version of that at some point. Um, more on that in the future, I guess. Um, also, my PFS triage. We, should we do? Yeah, that? when we talked about it, we got a few minutes left. Um, should I share my screen? Sure. Am I sharing my screen? Uh, All right. All right. Temporal. This one is familiar. Yeah. I think I commented on this. There's. Uh, oh, I know. I commented because I had no, I still don't have merge uh, rights what? in this repo. <laughs> <laughs> that makes triage a bit harder for me. Uh, yeah, I, I already like gave a thumbs up for this because it's like meeting content policy. Uh, there's like a free tier of their gateway. I believe. Let's double check. All right. You have merge rights now. Do I? I think they also uh, made some experimental enhancements of the gateway. Uh, hmm. So, so they, like, they provide a gateway which you can like pass parameter to return custom content type, which uh, is interesting thing I want to look at. Because yeah. uh, it's both interesting from the security standpoint, what are unknown like risks related to that. However, we had historically problems like people wanted to load WebAssembly files from our gateways and our gateways were not returning the proper content type, effectively like blocking people from using uh, IPFS for distribution of web websites which run the WebAssembly. Um, and the way uh, content type header is returned uh, from our uh, <coughs> from all gateways exposed by Go IPFS is uh, basically uh, either content sniffing based on the few bytes from the beginning of the file, or as a fallback, or maybe a priority, uh, just like the last uh, uh, characters after uh, dot <laughs> as a get best best guess of the file type. Uh, which is very crude uh, thing, and like this, we had this same problem with like web package, like sign HTTP exchanges. When we participated in the origin trial, we had to overwrite content type at the nginx level, and a lot of people who want to run like WebAssembly and other stuff, they basically need to override that at the uh, nginx uh, level. Uh, so we probably could improve that. Oh, I can merge. I can merge now. Um, question, do we merge or do we squash and merge? We probably merge. Thoughts, feelings? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I don't, I don't think it really matters that much. For... I think in this repo, it's, it's fine to just merge. Um, I mean, we, we have an action item to totally change how the whole process works anyway. <laughs> let, let me quickly like see what what's the convention for this repo i don't want to anger people who will be reading uh i think we'll squash it, and merge it's squash usually squash but sometimes merge I, i'll i'll just squash because it's like easier uh, I'm, I'm a fan of i'm a fan of squashing yeah. uh, ba, ba, ba. <laughs> <laughs> So 
smiley faces. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. I think we got like three minutes, so I don't feel it will be fair for the next one to rush it. <laughs> uh yeah but, but we probably should spend more time maybe like when that uh, recurring call for the, those types of things happen yeah uh, i got uh, permissions now so i have no excuse <laughs> <laughs> all right it was nice to see you both all right see this you my, see you my favorite general. meeting of the week See you in January, this time for real. There's no for meeting real. next week. And for the next next week, see you in January. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>